thank you for that encouragement. It's always good to be for you, to be able to present God's word to you. I must confess I'm feeling rather unworthy today. In part because I know the Lord is dwelling within us, that Christ is among us, that the Holy Spirit is within your hearts. And it's my prayer that this lesson this morning may glorify the Father. I don't know if you knew this, but we had a theme this year, and it's to love one another. And we've just concluded our summer series on loving one another. Uh, And if you weren't here last Thursday for Matt Perez's topic on being devoted to one another, you missed a powerful lesson. In my opinion, it's the best. The good news is we have a thing called YouTube, and you can go online and watch it if you weren't there. So I'd highly encourage you to do that. But over these last few months, we've been exploring our key verse in John chapter 13, beginning of verse 34. And if you want to go ahead and turn your Bibles there, we'll be looking at it here momentarily. But through our summer series, we've explored a lot about how we are to love one another. We've talked about concepts uh, about bearing with one another, admonishing one another. We sung to each other. We submit to each other. We are unified in one spirit with one another. We encourage one with one another. And of course, we are devoted with one another. And after all, it was Christ himself who pointed to the crowds and said, these are my brothers and my mothers. We are to be a family to one another, unified by Christ. And so of course, what is a family for those who are devoted, who bear with one another, who submit to each other? This morning, I want to discuss less about the how we are to love one another and explore a little bit more about the why we are to love one another. And then once we get a really solid understanding of why we are to love one another, I then want to explore the fruits of that love. After all, Christ said, you will know them by the fruits. And in Galatians 5, we understand that the fruits of the Spirit are what? The first one is love. And so there should be evidence for love within this congregation. Something we can point to that says, see, we are fulfilling the command. Here is evidence of the love being manifested within this local body. Our sermon this morning is titled, A Testimony of Your Love. Let's go ahead and turn to chapter 13 of John and begin in verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Now there are three main parts to this command. There is the command itself to love one another. Then Christ gives a manner, something we can uh, measure ourselves to. And he says, as I, referring to himself, Christ, have loved you. And within this command, he even gives a purpose, a why behind it, so that all people will know that you are my disciples. Now, before we go any further, if we were just to look at this verse and pull it straight out of context, we can understand that this command is important. Why? Because the Creator himself just repeated something three times. Love one another. Love one another. Love one another. So this isn't something that a Christ is simply, uh, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, you should love one another. No, he's telling them this is of first importance. And then as we look elsewhere in scriptures, as Christ gave the greatest command, it is to what? Love the Lord your God. And the second is like this, to love your neighbor. And of course, as we read in the epistles, uh, as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul gives a beautiful description of what love is. And in verse 8, he says, love never ends. And then he draws a comparison. Prophecies, they'll pass away. Knowledge, pass away. Tongues will cease, but these three things will abide, he he concludes in verse 13. Now faith, hope, and love will abide, but the greatest of these is what? Love. So we understand love is paramount. It is foundational to who we are as Christians. In fact, as Christ said here in this command itself, is the identifying characteristic of who we are as Christians. 
it's our love for one another. But right now, I want to talk about the purpose. There you go. Because I guess my question as a student of God's word, is the purpose simply for people to identify that we are Christians and then move on with their lives? To say, wow, that person's got a lot of love. Cool. And they move away. Or is it something else? And so I, I would contend, and I think scripture agrees, that the purpose of our love is not for people to know that we are Christians and move on. It's for people to know that we are Christians and be drawn in. But of course, I want to explore a little bit more. Because why is it so important for people to be drawn in? And there's a lot of verses we could go to that would help us to understand why love is so important. But I think there's one verse in particular that summarizes God's mission statement, if you will. His whole purpose. Everything he's done from the beginning of time till now. It's in 1 Timothy chapter 2. And I'll go ahead and begin in verse 1, but it really concludes there in verse 4. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. For kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires what? That all people, all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. That is why we love one another. To draw people in, to cause people to cling together so that they may be saved by the knowledge and the truth of Christ our Savior. So it's interesting because when I look at this, I think love is evangelistic. I'm not sure if you've ever thought about love in that way. Oftentimes when we think about evangelism, we're thinking about teaching, preaching, getting on a stage like this, giving a devo, going out, knocking on doors. But the truth is, love itself is evangelistic. In fact, I like to think of love really like a magnet. We've all played with magnets, I hope. You have two magnets, and when they're a certain distance apart, nothing, right? But then as you move one closer to another, there becomes a point where suddenly you start feeling a tug, a force, trying to pull it closer and closer. And as you move the magnets closer and closer, what happens? It gets stronger and stronger. And I remember as a kid, I'd hold two magnets just millimeters apart, shaking, trying to keep them from, from coming together. And eventually they come together. And it's when they're together, that's when they're the strongest. That's when it becomes hardest to pull them apart. So again, our love is what draws people in and causes us to cling together. And it's when we're closest is when we're strongest. But there's also a sense of urgency to this command. There's an importance to it. And I think the Hebrew writer would help us to understand why this is so important. If you want to turn to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews 3, beginning in verse 12. It says, take care, brothers, lest there be any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another, which is exactly one of the things we talked about in fulfilling our command to love one another. But exhort one another every day as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, for we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. You see, the Hebrew writer is saying there is a real risk of falling away. There is a real risk of letting sin come in and ripping us away from Christ. Exhort one another, he says. Love one another. Hold fast to one another. And continuing on in chapter 4 and verse 1, it reads, Therefore, while the promise of entering the rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. And continuing on in verse 11 of the same chapter, let us therefore strive to enter the rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. The Hebrew writer in this passage is referring to the Israelite nation when they were brought out of Egypt. Here's a people who received good news. Your bondage of slavery is over. And saw incredible signs that the Egyptians were judged, as armies were crushed, as seas were open, as food fell from the sky, as the voice of God was spoken on a mountain. 
And yet, because of their disobedience and their lack of unity, they fell short of the promise of the rest. That is why it is so important for us to love. But it's also the manner in which we are to love. And of course, Christ gives himself as the chief example. We are, of course, to look to Christ as our example, as our Savior. What other name would he call on for man to be saved but Christ? But are we only to look at Christ? The short answer is yes, but also, as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So we can look to one another to inspire, to encourage, to challenge us as each of you imitate Christ and perform various works. So do, do I try to imitate Christ? By seeing what you're doing, I'm encouraged, I'm uplifted, I'm challenged. As the verse says, outdo one another in love. And so we constantly work. But in Hebrews 6, there beginning of verse 10, it reads, For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints, as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have a full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Of course, I've got to ask myself, who are those who through faith and patience inherit the promise? You just got to turn the pages over to Hebrews chapter 11, as we often like to call the hall of faith. And there in that chapter we see, by faith, Abel, by faith, Enoch, by faith, Noah, by faith, Abraham, by faith, Moses, and the list goes on and on, and it culminates there uh, in verse 32. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and of Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put four armies away, Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. And of course, it concludes in a climatic way there in chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And just one more verse from Hebrews chapter 13. Verse 7 reads, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. You see, this is part of who we are as a local body. To encourage one another, to imitate Christ so that we too may see Christ being manifested among us. That we may become imitators of, our, of one another, but chiefly imitators of Christ. So to kind of rewrite the commands in a slightly different way, in fulfilling this command by loving one another, we become imitators chiefly of Christ, but also of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise so others too may be drawn and cling to the saving truth of Christ. That's why. That's why we love one another. So the question is, is that what we see here? Is this the kind of fruit that's coming forth from our church, from our love? And I like to say yes, absolutely. And of course, as I, as I said uh, at the beginning of this lesson, Matthew 7, verse 20 says, thus you will recognize them uh, by their fruits. And, and Christ is referring, or he's drawing a picture. He says, good trees will produce good fruits, bad trees will produce bad fruits. Thus you will know them by their fruits. And I could speak in vague terms and generalities about some of the work that's being done in this congregation. 
But I'm reminded of a passage in Revelation chapter 12. In Revelation chapter 12, if you read this chapter, it makes a great movie scene. You see this great dragon battling against heaven, and angels are fighting against him, and eventually they overcome him and cast him down to the earth. And then you hear the voice of God proclaiming, and there in verse 11, and they, referring to the saints, have conquered him, the dragon, the serpent, the devil, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. You see, we overcome the evil one chiefly by Christ. But we also encourage and are able to overcome him through our testimony of how Christ has changed our lives and freed us from sin. So this morning, there's only one testimony I can share with you with any level of confidence. And that's my testimony of how my life fundamentally changed because of you and your love. So we got to talk about 8th grade Mason. So just for some context, my family has been coming here for 15 years, which is a little mind-boggling to me because last I checked, 15 years was when I was a baby. Nope, I was in 8th grade 15 years ago. How life goes on. And I texted my mom earlier this week and said, hey mom, I need that picture of me from 8th grade, the one that's on the piano. A little bit later, she sends me the picture, this one, like, oh yeah, this one. I'm going to embarrass myself this morning. You see, this is me in eighth grade. Don't, aw, I look like a doofus. <laughs> <laughs> Here I thought I was the bee's knees with my long Justin Bieber hair, wearing tight shirts, and yes, that's me flexing. Why? Because the photographer told me to flex in the picture. But there's something I need you to understand about this, Mason. Because while he looks happy, you see that smile on his face. And some of you remember, he was dead inside. He looked around himself and said, what is the point of it all? All I see is evil. Vanity of vanities, all is vanities. What's the point? We're born, we work, we die. I look around and see the kids that I grew up who were once innocent children, now filled with all kinds of evil as they curse one another, disrespect their parents, disrespect their teachers. They gossip, they slander, they talk about all kinds of horrid things. And I knew my God. Amen. Righteous and just. And sin leads to death. But worst off, I hated myself. Because the evil I saw in them, I saw in myself. I heard my own voice as I slandered others and cursed others. And I knew in my own heart the kind of lust that was within it. The amount of time I spent looking at things no child of God should look at to satisfy the lust in my heart. And I knew, if God is just, and I'm a sinner, there's only one thing that I deserve. That's death. And so I went about my days just waiting for the time that God would finally exact his justice and take me from this wretched world. But then there was one fateful, fateful evening when my family decided to visit the Bulverde Church of Christ. It was smaller then. We didn't have this building. We were over there in the annex. And I remember walking in, and Michael Ibram was leading singing that night on Wednesday. And for the first time, I saw someone sing with joy joy to their father. And I looked around and I saw the same joy in one of another. And I myself was caught up in that joy. And then John Lasseter got up there and I don't remember the lesson he gave, but I remember the tenderness with which he gave it. How for the first time I saw someone say, yeah, 
you messed up. You were a sinner. And yet, God loves you. And Christ came for you. And Christ died for you. So that you may join him in heaven someday. Never have I heard such compassion and love come from a preacher. And I don't remember who gave the closing prayer, but I remember as the times went on as we continued visiting, the young men, Luke Perkins, and the zeal and the love they would give their prayers to God. There's only one person I've ever heard pray like that. And that was my own dad. And so it moved me. It moved me to be a part of you and the work that you're doing. It was funny, though, because that evening as we left services, my parents were doing the responsible thing. They were talking with one another, debating, is this a congregation we want to work with? Do we want to continue with them? What do we think? Are they doctrinally sound? They're really splitting hairs, and I'm just thinking in the back of the car, what are we even talking about? Of course we need to go there. Who else has such love? Who else has such zeal for the Lord? Never in anywhere we've gone have these people demonstrate such love. Of course, I didn't say that. I was 15, year old, 15 years old. I think the only thing I said was, I like it there. You don't get much more out of teenagers, do you? <laughs> but fate would have it that we would come here. And we've stayed ever since. So I want to talk about the testimony of your love. Which is really just me saying thank you. First, I want to say thank you to our older members, those who are gray in the head. And let me just say Proverbs 16, verse 31. Gray hair is a crown of glory. It is gained in a righteous life. You are the pillars of our church. Every time you come here, you just say hi, or you give a hug. Every time you stand on the stage and give just a little bit of your wisdom. Every time you come to a breakfast Bible study, you share what you've learned from the Lord. Or perhaps pull us aside and giving us an encouraging word. I was listening, and it drew me closer to our God and to our parents. Thank you for treating me as a child, for picking me up when I fell down, for letting me know I'm worth it. Every time you opened your home to me, letting me know that I'm part of a bigger family family of God. And what could I say to our youth who inspire me more than they ever realize? Whose zeal and passion and love for the Lord pushes me day after day to continue growing. Never stop growing. Never stop loving one another. And let me just say, the one thing I think that inspires me more is as I'm sitting behind you guys, and oftentimes as we lead a closing prayer, I see you reach out, you hold one another's hands, unified in Christ. For you, I give God the glory. And to our little children, let me just tell you, you have more power than most to bring us closer to Christ. For you, were, you remind us of who we once were and who we are to be. So little children, I want to encourage you. Continue loving us. Continue writing us cards. Continue uh, just giving us a hug, saying hi, drawing us pictures, giving us stickers. That means more than you will ever realize. And so for you, little children, I give God the glory. I want to end with a song. It's a song called Find Us Faithful by John Moore. And it paints a beautiful picture of how we and the work we do here on earth matters. How the work that we do is what causes the next generation to rise up and follow suit, to follow Christ. And it reads this. 
We're pilgrims on the journey of the narrow road, and those who've gone before us lie in the way, cheering on the faithful, encouraging the weary, their lives a stirring testament to God's sustaining grace. Surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run the race not only for the prize, but as those who've gone before us, let us leave to those behind us the heritage of faithfulness passed on through godly lives. After all our hopes and dreams have come and gone and our children sift through all we've left behind, may the clues that they discover and the memories they uncover become the light that leads them to the road we each must find. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. And may the fire of our devotion light their way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe, and the lives we live inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. You see, we play a crucial part in leading the next generation to Christ. And it begins with our love for one another. And so my encouragement to you this morning is keep loving. Know that those cards, just saying hello, picking up the phone, all of that matters so much more than we could ever quantify. It is the reason we come together. And one day, if the Lord doesn't come, we too will find ourselves joining that great cloud of witnesses, cheering on those who are coming on after. May we strive to be a part of that great cloud. And I want to end simply with a challenge. Because I would love nothing more than after this service, as we end in a closing prayer, you just go to one another, and you hug them, and you say thank you, but above all, you say, I thank you that God put you in my life. For all, God gets all the glory. But if you're not part of this family, as 8th grade Mason would say, what are you thinking? There's no better place to be, no better family to be a part of than the family of Christ. Begins by crucifying yourself in the waters of baptism. Because that 8th grade Mason you see, he's dead. It's Christ who now dwells in me. And if you find yourself pulling away from this family, pulling away from the love of God, come back. Come back. We can pray for you. We can serve you. It would be our greatest joy and honor to do so. If there's any need that we can serve you with, will you come forward as we stand and as we sing?